Scouts Victoria respectfully acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country throughout Victoria where our activities take place today. We pay our respects to elders both past, present and emerging and continue to recognise and embrace the important continuous history and connection to land and community of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people. G'day and welcome to Scout Quest. I'm Jim from First Mall and I'm a venturous scout. We are so excited to be back for 2021. Last year we had over 155,000 views for Scout Quest. Thank you so much for joining this adventure with us. Today we are catching up with our friends inside the barn at the RSPCA and getting to meet animals to hear their stories. Today we will meet Dr Gabriel and we again welcome back Emily. Hi guys, thank you for joining us again. Thanks, Jimmy. We are very excited as well. Um, we, I'm an education officer here at RSPCA Victoria, but I've got a very special guest, as Jimmy mentioned. I've got Dr. Gabriel Carter. Now, you're not an education officer, but you are a veterinary behaviour specialist. Would you be able to explain to us what involves, what your job involves? Yeah, sure. So. Um, as a vet uh, behaviour specialist, it means that I am a vet, uh, but most of the animals that I see, the cats and dogs mainly, uh, have behavioural or mental health issues. So I'm going to see dogs with uh, anxiety problems like separation anxiety perhaps, or perhaps they're dogs that are scared of thunderstorms or fireworks. I'm going to see dogs and cats that are aggressive towards people or aggressive towards other cats and dogs. Um, I might see cats that pee in the house or even animals with compulsive disorders, like they can't stop themselves chasing their own tail. So that's the sort of work that I do. And what I've found in my job is that something that's really helpful for owners of um, cats and dogs is to be able to read their body language. So if you can read your body language of your pet, you know what's going on for them. You know what they're feeling. Um, you're going to be able to predict what they might do next. And you're going to be able to help them out when they're in trouble. So for my clients, I find that the animals are giving them lots and lots of messages about what's going wrong, and they're really asking the owners for help. But because the owners can't read their body language, they're missing all these messages. So what I thought we'd do today is have a chat about the body language of cats and dogs and see if we can make it easier for you to read your cat or dog's body language. So when we read body language, what we want to do is look at a whole lot of different parts of the dog or the cat. So we're going to look at the eyes, the ears, the mouth, generally what the body's doing, um, and at the tail. And we're going to take this bit of information and pull it all together to get a picture of what's going on. So it's like putting together a jigsaw puzzle. You're going to take all these little pieces of information that the animal's giving you and try and create a picture of what's going on for that animal. So uh, what I think we'll do is start by having a look at some dog body language. So um, I'm going to get Michelle to put up the first picture for us of a dog, uh, or two dogs actually. Uh, this is picture number one. And what we're going to see here is uh, a big dog. And if we look at this big dog's body language, we'll see that she's leaning backwards. Her body is lowered to the ground. Her tail is starting to tuck in between her back legs. Her ears are back. And very importantly, you'll notice that she's looking away from that other dog. So all these signs are telling us that she's feeling a little scared, a little uncomfortable, very unsure about this other dog approaching. On the other hand, if we look at the little dog, the little white and tan dog, we'll see that she's actually standing pretty upright and tall. Her ears are forward. Her tail is up and she's walking towards that other dog. You'll also notice that she's staring at the other dog. And that stare uh, could be a little bit of a confrontation, a little bit of a threat. So that little dog is pretty confident and maybe even threatening that bigger dog by doing a stare. So um, if you stare at a cat or a dog, this can be taken as a threat by the animal. So it's best to avoid looking at dogs and cats directly in the eye. Like you might think that you're being friendly, 
But from the animal's perspective, they may find this direct stare that you're doing as a little bit of a threat. Now, another good piece of the puzzle that we can uh, get from dogs and cats is looking at their tails. So let's uh, look at dogs and uh, what their tails are going to be telling us. Now, most people think that a wagging tail means that we have a happy dog. Now, that's not necessarily the case. So um, some dogs will wag their tail if they're happy. Um, but these dogs are going to be very relaxed in their body. Okay, so the tail we're looking for in a friendly, relaxed dog is when it's loosely wagging from side to side. And we're going to see the whole body all loose and relaxed and probably the whole backside is going back and forth with that tail as well. Um, this is telling you that that's a friendly tail wag. Now, some dogs, though, will be very, very stiff. So they'll have a tail that's very stiff. When it's wagging, it'll be going like this, back and forth. The whole body will be very stiff. You might find that their face is very stiff. Their mouth is closed. And this is a dog that may not be so friendly, even though it's wagging its tail. I have seen plenty of dogs wagging their tails that then go on to bite another dog or to bite another person. So when you see a wagging tail, you need to look at other parts of the body to work out whether that's a friendly interaction or whether it might be a dog that's looking for a little bit more trouble. So um, let's have a look at some tails. Um, so Michelle, perhaps you could show us uh, picture number two. Now this is, um, I want you to all have a look at this dark brown dog here. And you'll see that the tail of this dog is sticking upright into the air. It is very stiff and very still. And this dog um, is quite threatening. He's giving us a couple of threatening messages. The tail's up. We'll also see that the dog's body is quite stiff and he's also staring at the other dog, okay? So um, this is a dog that you really don't want to pat. Now, I don't want you to get the message that um, all tails above the dog mean that they're not friendly because if we have a look at the next picture, which is picture number three, we'll see that um, this dog has its tail uh, curled over the back, but she's not aggressive at all. Actually, she's just really excited and engaged in some play. So we know this because her body's not tense. Um, we'll see that she's actually lowered the front of her body. Now, when dogs lower the front of their body but keep their bums up in the air, this is what we call a play bow. So this is saying, hey guys, let's play, let's have some fun. So this tail up high in this case, um, in com combination with the rest of the body language that we're seeing, and also the setup. We've got a dog with a foot on the ball. It suggests that she's just excited and uh, really wanting to engage in some play activities. Now, when hanging out with your dog, it's actually very important to recognise when they're feeling stressed, when they're feeling anxious or a little bit uncomfortable, okay? Because if you can pick that up early on, you can get them out of that situation. You can do something to help them. Uh, before they sort of go into a full-on sort of panic or get really, really anxious. So let's have a little look at a video that's going to show us some of the signs that dogs can show when they're feeling stressed. Hi, I'm Dr Gabriel Carter from the RSPCA Victoria. In this video, we're going to have a look at some of the different signs that dogs can show when they're feeling stressed, anxious, or even a little unsure. When dogs are feeling stressed, anxious, or unsure, it's very common to see them licking their lips and yawning. Of course, these behaviours can occur in other situations. For example, they've just finished a meal or they've just woken up. However, if they're in a scary or unfamiliar situation, it's more likely to tell us that they're feeling anxious or unsure. Similarly, dogs may pant when they're feeling stressed, even though they're not thirsty or hot. This little dog is feeling a bit stressed with the camera staring at her. Excessive licking of walls, glass, the floor, furniture, themselves or people tends to indicate that the dog's feeling a bit stressed. Another sign to watch out for is the shake-off. This occurs after a stressful event. 
So it tells you that what went before was stressful. It's a good idea to take a note of what the stressor was and to avoid putting the dog in that situation again. Dogs may hump in a stressful situation when they're unsure what to do. For example, they might want to interact with a person but at the same time feel a little bit worried about being touched. In this situation, the dog may start humping. In some dogs that are feeling anxious, we can see a puffing out of the cheeks. This is more common in our sight hounds, dogs like the greyhound or the whippet, but can occur in any breed of dog. When anxious, some dogs will simply shut down. This dog is feeling really, really stressed at the groomers. Despite loving food normally, this dog is not taking treats. Food refusal is a very common sign to see in a stressed or anxious dog. Alternatively, some dogs will actually start snatching when they're feeling stressed and may even end up nipping you. When a dog normally takes treats gently but is now snatching, this tends to indicate that they're feeling stressed or anxious. When you see wrinkles on a dog's face when they're not normally there, this indicates some muscle tension in the face. Generally, this is going to occur when the dog is feeling a little stressed or anxious. Sometimes it can look like they're frowning. Now you have some pointers of what to look for, you can start to pick up when a dog is feeling stressed, anxious or unsure and take some action to help them relax. Okay, so um, now we have some tips on understanding uh, how to read dog body language and work out what dogs are trying to communicate to us. We can also have a think about what our body language might be communicating to dogs. So um, let's have a look at the next picture, Michelle, um, picture number four. What we'll see here, if you look at it, what most people do when they approach dogs is they, they walk front on. They're generally looking the dog in the eye. They then tend to loom over the top of the dog and pat the dog on top of the head. Now, all these sorts of behaviours, all these actions can be seen as quite threatening and scary from the dog's point of view. Um, well, let's have a look at it from the dog's point of view. Michelle, could you show us pick number five? That would be great. Um, so if we look at this, um, I think that looks pretty scary. <laughs> All right, so what's a better way to approach dogs? What's a more friendly way to do it? Um, let's move on and have a look at pick number six. So a better way to approach dogs is to approach from the side. If you feel comfortable and safe to do so, you might want to squat down so that you're at the dog's level. This way you're not going to be looming over the top of the dog. Then it's a good idea to pat them on the chest or perhaps the side of the neck rather than sort of reaching over the top of the head, which they may be uh, perceive as being a little bit more scary. And most importantly, you want to be watching their body language. Okay, so if the dog um, uh, starts moving away from you at all, uh, if the dog's tail starts tucking, if they lower their body cl closer to the ground, maybe they're feeling a little bit uncomfortable. Maybe they're feeling like, I'd like a little bit more space. So a really good test that you can do to work out whether the dog is actually enjoying the attention that you're giving them or not is to stop petting them, stop interacting and see what they do. So if you stop petting and the dog walks away, then they've probably had enough. If you stop petting and they come closer to you, perhaps even give you a nudge, then actually you can start uh, giving them a whole lot more loving. Okay, um, I think what we might do now is talk a little bit about cat body language. So um, yeah, not all of you own dogs, perhaps some of you have cats. So let's look at cat body language. And again, we're gonna start by looking at all these different parts of the cat. So we'll look at the tail, We'll talk a little bit about the ears and we're even going to talk about the whiskers. So the thing I find most useful about cats is their tails and it's really pretty simple. If the cat's tail is up in the air like this, they are friendly and they're wanting to say hello. If the cat's tail's down like that, actually they're pretty angry generally and they really don't want to interact with you. That's a cat you want to avoid. Okay, um, let's have a look at some uh, pictures of cats' tails in real life. So if we have a look at pick number seven, 
we'll see here that this cat's tail is being held high in the air and she's ready to say hello, she's ready to have a pat, uh, she's ready to hop on your lap, okay? If we look at the next cat, pick number eight, we'll see that this cat is actually very angry. We'll see that tail hanging down and it's all fluffed up. So she's getting ready for a fight. Another tail position that we probably see quite often in cats is when the tail is curled around the body. Now this is a fairly relaxed and contented cat. Um, well, I'll pick number nine. Um, so she's a pretty happy cat. Um, she's just happy hanging out where she is. And this is the thing about cats. They don't have to hug us. They don't have to be in contact. If you've got two cats that are great mates, often they'll just be sitting together. They might be touching. They might not be touching. They do that for hours on end. This is the way that they share uh, good times together. Now, another good place to look uh, when we're trying to interpret what cats are telling us is at their ears. And here's what cats' ears do. When they're just happy, content, hanging out, they're sort of sitting here fronting, facing forward. They might go a little bit more forward if they're really interested in something, but you know, this is pretty happy, relaxed position. When they're getting angry, the ears will go out to the side, so they'll point outwards. And then when they're getting really scared, they'll go low down and they'll go back. So what we have is ears forward, friendly, happy, out to the side, angry, and then lowered and back, means that they're getting really scared. So if we have a look at the next picture, um, this gives us a diagram of the ear positions. Okay, so we can see the happy um, and the angry and the really scared or frightened cat. Let's have a look at some of these uh, ear positions on real cats. So uh, let's look at pick number 11. So these two cats in this picture are both scared. So one of these cats is wanting to hide and one of these cats is really angry and they're being angry because they're trying to make that scary thing go away. But because in both cases the ears are facing back and down, we know that both these cats are scared um, despite the fact that they're showing very, very different behaviours at this time. Let's have a look at another scared cat. Maybe um, can we see pick number 12, please? Now here we again see these ears are back and I suggest that the person who's trying to interact with this cat stop doing that. They're actually scaring that cat. So this is a time for that person to back off um, and uh, uh, make that cat feel a little bit more comfortable. We mentioned uh, when the ears are out to the side. So if we can have a look at pick number 13, this will show us an angry cat, okay? We'll see these ears are pointing outwards and certainly this is a cat where you wanna get out of their way uh, pretty damn quickly. Now, I also wanted to tell you something about cat's whiskers. So because of the shape of the cat's head and where their eyes are positioned here, it means that they can't see in front of their face, okay? So this spot here in front of their mouth, in front of their nose, um, this is a blind spot. Now that makes it pretty hard if you're a cat and you wanna go and kill that mouse, for example, because you can't see that mouse that's right in front of your mouth. So what cats do is they have these whiskers that they bring forward. And these whiskers feel all this space in front of their mouth and their nose. And it sends this really detailed 3D picture to their brain so that they can see in front of their mouth. And that allows them to um, chomp on that mouse. So if you're watching a cat, and you see the whiskers go forward, it probably means that they're about to interact with something in front of them. Now that might be a toy, um, it might be to chomp on that mouse, or it might even be to give you a nip. Now one other behaviour that I wanted to talk about was when cats roll over. So we can have a look at um, pick number 15 here. So when a cat rolls over, it's saying that they're feeling uh, a little bit unsure, a little bit uncomfortable, but they wanna say, hey, you know, I don't want any trouble. Let's just be friends, let's just get on. They're asking that you be nice to them. It's what we call an appeasement behavior. So um, they're trying to reduce or avoid any potential threat that uh, they might think that you're going to do. 
What you don't want to do when you see these cats roll over and show you their belly is go and give them that big belly rub because what's likely to happen is that they're going to grab your arm with their claws and you may even get a quick little nip. Okay, so um, I think that's a little bit of an introduction to the body language of cats and dogs and body language is a really important tool for us when we're communicating with these pets. Another way to communicate with pets is through training. So when we train animals, it's a way of telling them what we would like them to do. So um, it's a way of giving them some direction. And we use training, we use reward-based training. And that means that we give them a reward every time they do a behaviour that we like. Because anything that gets rewarded tends to happen more often. And it's a way for them to go, oh, that was a good thing. Life is good when I do this sort of behaviour. And because we've got some training and we say sit, they go, oh, sit, I know what that means. I feel really good about that. I can control this situation and make sure it's good for me. So I thought we might end this little session today by having a look at a bit of training. And uh, I have uh, here with me today um, Ryan and his dog Lexi. Now, Lexi uh, doesn't really know yet uh, how to go to a mat on command, let alone stay there. So uh, we're going to try and do a little bit of training with Ryan. That sounds wonderful, Dr. Gabby, and thank you for explaining. Oh, hello. <laughs> Thank you for explaining um, all of that fa fascinating information about um, working with cats and working with dogs. Now, because you're going to be working with a real live dog now, I'm going to transfer our camera onto a movable gimbal stick. So I might ask Michelle to just mute our camera just for a moment. Just give me a minute to transfer the camera over to the gimbal and then we can get started with some training with Lexi and with Ryan. Perfect. Great. Sounds great. We'll wait for the camera to mute and so you don't feel seasick. Okie dokie. So everyone, we're back. Hopefully you can now see Ryan. Hello, Ryan. Give us a wave. Hello. Hi. And Ryan's beautiful dog, Lexi. Hi, Lexi. All right, away you go, guys. Okay, so let's start our training session. What I want you to do first is uh, show Lexi some treats and let her have a couple of treats just so she knows that, oh, there's something good happening. Um, she already knows how to sit, doesn't she? Yeah. yeah, okay. So it's good to start your training session with something that she knows. So yeah. asking her to sit and giving her treats is perfect. And you're doing a great job. Nice hand signal, nice sit. Okay, so what I'm going to get you to do to teach her to go to a mat is first get the treat in front of her and lure her, guide her onto the mat. That's it. That's perfect. Excellent. And, yep, give her the treat when she's there. Let's bring her off and try that again. So show her the treat and lure her onto the mat. Nice, nice. And again, let's get it back. One more time. Lure her there. Excellent. So we'll ask her for a sit there. I like yeah. to see her sitting on the mat because right. it's a nice calm position. Yeah. Good. Well done, Ryan. Beautiful. Ryan and Lexi are doing a great job here. Keep giving her treats. I want her to have lots of treats when she's on the mat. And freebies are good as well. So um, what we want to do is keep giving her treats because I want her to say, when I'm on the mat, good things happen. I want to stay here. Yeah. Now what we're going to do is to um, just move away a little bit because eventually we want to move away. But I want you to come back. Whoa, yeah. So we need to come back before she gets off the mat. So just one step back and a quick come back to her now. Beautiful, Ryan. That was beautiful demonstration of training. And again... Nice. One step back and back to her. So I want her to be uh, staying on that mat. In fact, I'm going to take this off this lead up for yeah. you because I think it might be a bit easier for both of you because yeah. she's used to following the lead. So we take that off, it's going to be better. 
Nice. Okay, one step back and come back to her again. Just repeat. Good. Good. And again. And again. Beautiful. Okay, let's try two steps back. Yeah. Well, now if she comes off like that, that's fine. Let's, well, oh, oh, she knows where the bone is. Oh, oh dear. It. It's, it's Dr. Gabby. Is She's this, coming back. Is it an unusual occurrence? No, not at all. So um, Lexi knows that there's a very, very high treat around the corner. Um, it's like having a big birthday present around the corner. So even though we're giving her little treats here, she was like, no, I want that big one. But she's yeah. back. So she's going to stay here for us now. Okay, let's try it again. Good on you. So one step back and treat one step back and treat good two steps back and treat good excellent two steps back again and again perfect okay three steps back yeah lexi's doing well ryan's doing fantastic yeah right good girl okay keep going oh okay she came off no mm -hmm. problems that's all right that's going to happen what we need to do now well done, Ryan. Lure her back and we're just going to do one step back again. Make it easy. We want to set her up to succeed. Okay, so we just went a little bit too quickly for her. We'll try again. Two steps back. Oh, get her in a sit. Yep. Good girl. Good girl. And sit again for us. Excellent. Beautiful. So back, wriggle your arms in the air next time. Ryan, when you go back, we'll see what happens. Whoa! Hey, well done. Because eventually you're going to have to add in um, some um, uh, distractions. Because really, eventually you want to be able to walk into the kitchen, get yourself a milkshake while she stays on the bed. Okay. So... Uh, yeah, so we need to add in some of those attractions. But I think you've both done really well. I think that's a high five. Hey. Ooh. High five. High five. Yeah. And a high five for you. Well done, Ryan. That was absolutely perfect. Thank you very much for coming in today. Right. That was really good. Have we got any more time, guys? I believe so. Yeah. Uh, I believe we might even have time to go in and meet a cat or two. Yeah, let's do that. And we might be able to have a look at their body language perhaps and see what they're telling us. Fantastic. All right, let's go. I'm just okay. going to get my uh, camera sorted. There we go. Okay. All right, so we'll head in through that, that door. Oh, we'll go the other way. Okay. I'll just make sure my mark is on too. So we can go and meet some cats. All right, so Miss Belinda will need to, sorry, there you are, hello. Uh, Miss Belinda will need to bring the laptop with us um, so that it, she'll be able to pick up our voices. Oh, so we'll go and just give her a... Would you like me to bring it with me? Um, yeah, that'd be great, actually. Okay. Thank you. I can disconnect. No, I'll leave that one on. Thanks, guys, for your patience. We've Because we finished a little bit early... Um, it, with the dog training, it means that we get to go inside and go off script and just meet some cats. Great. Okay, welcome to the education office. Now, here you will be able to get a bit of a clue about what some of the cats look like. In we go, in we go. Oh, excellent. On, it's behind the scenes, which is very exciting. Yep, this is where it all happens. Oh, <laughs> and look who's here to oh, greet us. They're ready and they're waiting. Here we go. So looking through the window just briefly here, I can see Alfie who's on my right. And Alfie, well, now he's moved. Alfie's the ginger and white cat. Hello, Alfie. And... On the other side there, another ginger cat that is Archie. And when we go inside, I can speak to you a little bit more about their stories. So I might follow you in. If you'd like to go in and take a have a seat somewhere where you're comfortable, Dr. Gabby. Hi, guys. How are you? <laughs> Good to see all their tails up in the air. Look at that. Oh, happy cats. That's fantastic, Emily, isn't it? They love people, obviously. They all want to interact. Tails are up saying, hey, 
Oh, I'm so okay. excited to see some of the chat that might Ooh, be coming through about our beautiful cats. Now, I'm just going to organise our camera here because my gimbal stick is having a moment. Hello, and then this just is like a... we know technology. So, if you're uh, going to feel a bit seasick, just in a moment, it's the camera is going to move. So, I apologise about that. It's just going to. It's trying to go portrait mode. So, I'm just going to bring it back to where we want it to be. Oh, I know. It's unbalanced. Oh, there we go. It's it's trying its best. We'll just slide Hello. it across. Thanks for your patience, everyone, while we work with our interesting technology. Sometimes it does what we want and sometimes it doesn't. All right. So hopefully in a moment we'll be able to get you back. We can still see you, Dr. Gabby. Hello. Oh, hello. <laughs> I'm not quite sure whether I was there or not. I would like to say hello to one of these guys. That sure. Would be really nice. How are we going? All right. Give us a sec. All right. So oh. hopefully, oh, Belinda's brought them some a toy as well. That's exciting. Oh, and some treats. Look at that. Look at okay. that. Okay, so. guys. Oh, a free treat is always good, isn't it? Here we go. You want another treat? Because you know you can train cats in exactly the way, same way that you train dogs. This is a. Uh, Oh, we've got somebody who's interested in training. Look, tail's <laughs> up, coming and approaching. Hey, do you want a, do you want a treat? Whoa. So this is Alfie. What's this twitching that he does with his tail? Oh, I think that's just being excited. So Very you're really excited. excited. You're like, oh, <laughs> I, I can't wait to have some more treats. He obviously likes his treats. So gorgeous. So these yeah. guys have been part of the education program for a number of years. So they are used to people. Yeah, so let's see if we can teach uh, something. Maybe touch. Oh, touch my finger, and then I'll give you a treat. Okay. So all I'm going to do is put my finger out here, and say so if you touch it, I'll give you a treat. There it is. Oh, well, you can't see it, can you? Because it's right in front of your nose. Okay. Do you want it? Touch and a treat. Okay. You ready? Touch. You get a treat. I can hear Alfie purring away. Oh, yeah. So purring is a very interesting thing, Emily. Um, purring generally occurs when they're happy, but it can also occur when they're not so happy. It's like one of those appeasement behaviours. So sometimes as a vet, I'll have cats come into my vet clinic and purr, and it's a bit like going to the dentist, I think, going to the vet. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a good thing. Most cats probably don't like it. So why are they purring on the consult table but a lot of the time it's because they're feeling a bit uncomfortable they're a little bit unsure and so they're going hey I'm a little bit unsure Gab you know let's just be nice to each other you know I don't want any trouble um whoop, here we go oh there you go um so that's what purring often says whoa so now that I've got some following my finger look what I can do I can make him walk across the room. Oh, and that happened quite quickly. They were quick learners. Are they advanced learners, do you think? <laughs> I think cats actually learn quicker than dogs. Look at that. Here you go. There you go. That's quite surprising. Now, once I've got them doing that, how about I use this? Here we go. Let's see now if I can get you to come up here. Oh, look, I got him up on the seat on command. And do you know what? I'm not sure with your veterinary experience, you can probably have a guess, but Archie oh, is 16 years old. Oh. So this cat that's showing us all of these beautiful oh. behaviours and he's learning so well, he's an elderly man. He is showing us that you can teach old cats new tricks. <laughs> on, he's Dad. doing so well. He's doing very well. Somebody's wanting to nudge in on us there. One more time. Hey, hard for an old man jumping up. Oh, isn't it? good boy. That's a good fella. So there's a simple trip that you might want to try at home with your cat. Find some nice treats. And I'm going to give them some little treats in this toy that has been made up out of toilet rolls. This oh. is a clever idea, isn't it? So oh, we can use what we have at home to create safe toys for our pets. So this is just the toilet rolls, the cardboard, probably a little bit of safe, non-toxic PVA glue or something similar. Of course, non-toxic is important. 
We're not using sticky tape because we don't want our animals to be eating plastic. Uh, but this is quite a fun puzzle for them. Oh, they it? love it. And it's so much better than eating out of their food bowl, which is pretty boring. Well, Archie knows what he's doing. Yeah. Well, he's Alfie's having guy. a go. Well done. So you might be interested to know Alfie that we're looking at right now. He came in a few years ago um, with his friend, Kat, um, because his owner wasn't able to care for him anymore and they were surrendered. Both cats were surrendered and Alfie wasn't feeling well when he came in. But once our vets had checked him over, gave him the treatment that he needed, he then went to the adoption centre which is where, <laughs> where we met him <laughs> and discovered that he would be an amazing education cat because he is so friendly and yes. he likes other cats, which yes, is Yes, these are both very, very friendly cats and they really enjoy that interaction with people and they enjoy their treats, which makes training very easy. <laughs> oh, lucky cats. Yeah. They're doing so well. Now... Emily, would we like to move on and see if there's any questions? I think it's a good time. Now, I wonder if um, Jimmy and Michelle might be able to let us know if now is a good time for questions. Yes, I believe it is a pretty good time for questions. It's pretty cool to find out that uh, the cats and the dogs, uh, can you can train them pretty much the same way. It's pretty cool. So, um, so questions. Uh, do I read them from the uh, comments? Michelle? All right, I'll head up. I can see you again. Hello. Hello. Do we want to um, head back to the room or do we want to? I think we can stay here probably. Stay here? Stay here with the cats, yes. I think. Okay, let's do that. Um, but I need to hear the question. Yeah. Okay, cats we're listening. All right, cool. So right. we'll read the Ready first, the first, first one I can see. Does looking oh. a dog in the eyes release oxytocin? I heard that it does. Oh. Okay. Did you hear that one? Yes. Does looking dogs in the eyes release oxytocin? That's an interesting question. It is a very interesting question because we're talking about um, staring or looking at dogs in the eye, and I was suggesting that for some dogs they might find that stressful or threatening. So particularly with young kids and babies, they tend to really stare and they get that hard stare at the dog, and that can be quite scary. But a lot of our dogs are used to us looking in, in the eye. That's how we bring them up. And when we look them in the eye, it's often associated with good attention. So, uh, yeah, so a lot of dogs actually like us looking at them because we've trained them that that's what people do when they're being nice. Now, we do know from the research that there's a certain hormone called oxytocin that can get released in what we call bonding, uh, an affectionate uh, experience. So if you're bonding with somebody, um, so a person's bonding with a dog, we often see a release of this hormone called oxytocin, um, which makes you feel pretty good and comfortable and, hey, I really like you, you know, you're building that nice bond happening. And, yes, it's quite likely that dogs will also see a release of oxytocin when they're experiencing that bond as well. What an interesting question that was. Yeah, Thanks, guys. Yeah. I have another question. My dog doesn't play fetch anyway. I could teach him to play. How could I teach him to play? Play fetch. How would I? How my dog doesn't play fetch. How would I teach him to play fetch? So, so I'm reading the question because we're having a bit of audio difficulty. My dog doesn't play yeah. fetch. Anyway, I could teach him to play, or perhaps it's a question of could I teach him to play fetch? Mm, good question as well. So, I think there's two answers to that. Look, we probably could teach your dog to uh, play fetch. Um, some dogs will play it more easily than others. Um, so for some dogs, it would really be a bit of a hardship to learn how to play uh, fetch. So there's some dogs that have a natural tendency to want to fetch things, and they're probably dogs that we've trained uh, or we've bred to do fetching behaviours or perhaps herding behaviours as well. They like to keep everything together, so they'll go and run after that ball and bring it back and keep it in the in the herd really. Um, so uh, some dogs will be much easier to teach than others. However, if you really, really wanted to teach your dog how to herd, uh, how to, sorry, bring back something and that they don't have a natural tendency to want to do it, it is possible. The first step in doing that is actually get them used to picking something up in their mouth. So a lot of these dogs aren't particularly interested in toys and things like that. So we need to find something that they're really motivated to pick up. 
So that might mean getting, say, I don't know, a little rubber bone or a, it can be a little ball. Make sure it fits easily in their mouth. Make sure it's comfortable. Some dogs don't like them too hard. We might want something that's a bit softer. And maybe we rub a little bit of peanut butter or something on it that makes it tasty um, so that they're really motivated to perhaps pick that up. So we might give it to them and they go, oh, yeah, I want that. I've got it. Now, at that point in time, you might even want to bring out something even better than that peanut butter. So you might have a little bit of roast chicken sitting in your pocket. So when they grab that bone, you go, oh, fantastic. I'm going to give you some roast chicken. And we do that a few times. And what's going to happen? Your dog is going to go, hey, when I grab that bone, I get roast chicken. Woohoo, this is worth working for. So all of a sudden, you'll find this dog will start going, hey, I touched the bone, I touched the bone, even if they just touch it. I'm happy with that to start with. And over time, we're saying, no, you actually have to grab it. Then you have to hold it. So we need to break down that retrieving behaviour into tiny little steps. And it may start with just getting them to pick something up. Generally, that's the biggest hurdle to get over. Um, if you can get that happening, then all you do is you put that bone two feet away from you and see whether he'll bring it back to you. Or just go and pick it up or touch it a couple of uh, feet away from you. Um, over time, you'll be able to throw it further away and he will pick it up. Um, even if he doesn't bring it back at that stage, that's fine. You can still give him that roast chicken reward. Uh, once he's doing that reliably, then you can say, hey, no, you need to bring it a little bit closer. If he brings it halfway and drops it, that's better. You're on the road to getting the full behaviour that you want. So the trick is break it down into tiny little steps. Um, and, yep, if your dog's really hard, it could take you a month or more practicing every day but you can get there cool that's great uh another question why would my dog uh, uh, any more questions uh for us jimmy yeah so jimmy's um, probably i can't hear jimmy at all okay oh, there he is sorry um, all right why would my dog shiver could it be anxious i don't think he's cold so i don't know are you probably able to read it potentially or yeah okay so did you get that or? So I'm. Yeah, right. yeah we're why all good. We can dog... see the question. Okay, cool. And the question is? Why would my dog shiver? Could he be anxious? Why would my dog shiver? Could he be anxious? Yep, um, definitely. Um, shivering can definitely be sign of an anxious dog. Now, the thing about interpreting body language is you always need to do it in the context in which it occurs. Okay, so in the situation um, that it's happening, that's very important. So a dog obviously can shiver if they're cold, for example, but if they're sitting in a warm room in the house with you and there's a big clap of thunder and they start uh, shaking, then that's much more likely to be indicating that they're feeling anxious. And I think this is important for other behaviours that can indicate anxiety as well. So a dog might lick its lips if it's just finished eating, for example. But, um, and they might yawn uh, when they've just woken up. But if you bring out your nail clippers and the dog starts yawning and licking its lips, then I'll bet my bottom dollar that they're actually feeling anxious, that they're not just uh, finished a meal or that they're not uh, just got up from a sleep. So yes, looking at the context is very important. But definitely, if your dog's shivering, you wanna know why, um, and you're gonna need to address that either way. Either they're cold or they're anxious. Mm. Thank you for answering that one, Dr. Gabby. Um, that's really interesting looking at the full context. We have a question here for Chris, uh, from Chrissy, and Chrissy asks, what is the best way to help a dog who is scared during a thunderstorm? Yes, that's a very good question. Um, and uh, it can be very difficult. So some of these dogs are really terrified. I mean, I've seen dogs that will just shiver and shake during a thunderstorm. I've seen other dogs that just really panic. Um, in fact, I think one of the worst cases I ever saw was a dog that jumped through a plate glass window um, because he was so scared. So um, it really depends a little bit on just how uh, much panic they're showing and how much anxiety. If it's sort of fairly mild, um, then sometimes just giving them a little bit of comfort is enough. Some of these dogs just want to be with you. We think that a lot of it is the noise. Um, so if they can put them in a place that's a bit quieter. So a lot of these dogs will naturally go into wardrobes and places like that where there's lots of clothes that sort of dampen all the noise. Um, big, thick, you know, wooden 
wardrobe walls that try and make it a little bit quieter. So you might want to think about providing them somewhere that is a little bit more soundproof. Um, some dogs just having a little bit of company uh, will be good. And in some milder cases, we can do this trick where we associate that thunder and that noise with something really good. So in other words, maybe there's a clap of thunder and that's when you give that dog a bit of roast chicken. Now, at first, the dog's not going to know what's going on here. It's going to go, the big clap of thunder, I don't really want roast chicken, I'm a bit scared. But you say, no, come on, have it. And they go, oh, all right. Um, or you might want to use something even a little bit sticky like peanut butter where you can actually rub it around their mouth or on their lips so that they sort of have to take it. And what you'll find is uh, after a while, they'll put it together and they'll go, hey, every time there's a clap of thunder, I get peanut butter. Actually, maybe that's not so bad because though that thunder is making me feel anxious, the peanut butter is really good. Now, I know a lot of people think that's, that's really crazy, um, that that's not going to work. But And I did, to be honest. When I first heard this trick, I thought, this is not going to work. But I had a client who had a dog that was scared of thunderstorms. And I said, oh, look, I've heard about this. Why don't we give it a go? And so I sent her away. I didn't see her for about six months. And she came back into the clinic and for something else. And I said, oh, by the way, how did you go with that peanut butter thing? You know, you know, is your dog still running under the bed every time there's a clap of thunder? And she goes, oh, no, 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 it's really good. Every time there's a clap of thunder, he runs into the kitchen and looks at the peanut butter jar. <laughs> and I thought, okay, I'm convinced this can work for some dogs. So that's good for dogs that are sort of mild to sort of moderate anxiety but there will be others that are really suffering. And for some of those dogs, I think one of the best things that we can do is give them some anti-anxiety medications because they're really, really stressed and some of those dogs are panicking. So their welfare is being compromised. Um, and what happens if we give them medication that helps them feel relaxed during the storms? We do that for a few storms. The dogs are learning. They're learning that, oh, I don't feel stressed while there's storms going on. And for some of these dogs over time, we can wean them off the medication because they've learned, oh, I don't feel stressed during storms anymore. Um, and that can be a very effective way of helping resolve that problem. That's really fascinating. Thank you for explaining that. Particularly interesting about how the medication works. And I'm even going to try that peanut butter trick with my dog at home. So that's awesome. Excellent, Emily. Thank you. Let me know how it goes. I will. Now, we have another question from Di or D. I apologise if I have misread uh, your name. Our dog only listens to Dad. Can I teach him to listen to me as well? Ah, yeah, easy one. It's a good question, though, and I think it comes to the heart of what I think is a good relationship with the dogs. So we want to bond, and, you know, it's a bit like you. You, you, you follow people that you like um, and that meet your needs in some ways. So depending on your dog, you have to look at them and see what they like. So is your dog one that likes lots of pats and lots of attention and lots of physical contact? Maybe your dog's one that just likes hanging out with you. Yep, we're out in the garden together. Yep, let's go for a walk together. Let's hang out and do stuff. I don't big on all that physical stuff. So you have to work out what their needs are. So have a think about that. What does your dad do differently than what you're doing when you interact with the dog? One of the things I do find that dads tend to do um, is give the dog lots of directions. So they give very clear directions as well. So they'll say things like, hey, come here, sit good dog okay very clear what I find a lot of people do is they go come here come on come on come over to me come on let's have some fun and it's like the dog's whoa what, what are you saying what do you want oh I don't sure what's going on so sometimes giving very clear direction is helpful um, I also think if you start doing some training because that is all about giving clear direction you're saying sit stay and you're using reward-based training the dog's going to go i want to hang out with you this is good fun um, i know exactly what you want me to do it's not ambiguous I'm, I'm very clear about it i feel in control um and that that's probably a good way to go it's an interesting thing i will just want to point out to some of you here with about training so two things that help dogs that are a little bit anxious is making things more predictable and giving them a sense of control, okay? So maybe you think about going to school and sitting in an exam. Why are you anxious? 
well, you're anxious because you don't know what the questions are. You can't predict what's going on. And you're also not sure that you're going to be able to put the right answer down. Okay, so you feel like you're a little bit out of control. If you knew what all the questions were and you knew that you knew all the answers, you wouldn't be anxious at all. So if we can put control and predictability into your life and into your dog's life, they feel less anxious. And training is one way to do that. Because here's what happens. When you say to the dog, sit, okay, you think you're controlling the dog's behaviour. Well, you are. makes you feel good. But the dog's going, hey, watch this. I can control your reward-giving behaviour. Watch this. Look, I put my bum on the ground. You gave me a treat. Hey, look at this. I can do it again. I put my bum on the ground. Poof, she just gave me a treat. So um, if we interact in, with dogs in this sort of training type way, it's very predictable It's very because we do the same thing the same way over and over and over again and the dog has a sense of control. They're going to love hanging out with you. So I hope that helps you uh, die a little bit on um, uh, sorting out your problems with your dog. That sounds amazing and it makes a lot of sense. Um, I think I'm one of those people that confuses my dog. So now I can have a go at uh, giving them more clear instructions. Emily asks, good name, thanks, Emily. Emily asks, is there a way to help a dog that is older and has joint pain? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, there's two things I think to consider uh, with that. One is obviously physically they're in a little bit of pain, so can we relieve that pain? And I definitely think that's worth going to your vet and having a chat to them. There's some wonderful things that we can do to help reduce pain in dogs. But today we're talking about behaviour and I think, yeah, pain and arthritis can certainly affect behaviour in a big way. You might find, for example, that it's actually quite hard to teach that dog to drop down on the ground because actually it's painful and difficult for that dog to lie down and then get up again. So it's going to affect their behaviour. They may not want to go upstairs. Um, they may not want to jump up on the couch with you anymore. Uh, so they may start lying on their bed over there and you're going, oh, he doesn't like me anymore or he's a bit offhand, but actually that's just because uh, it's just too hard. Some of these dogs, particularly as they get older, a bit more painful. Other things we might see is like losing their sight, losing their hearing. They start feeling more vulnerable, okay? And when you're feeling um, more vulnerable, you're generally a little bit more anxious. So anything that we can do to help these guys out um, is going to make them feel less anxious and have better quality of life. So first step for you, Emily, is go see your vet, um, talk about some pain relief and have a look at how your dog moves around, uh, what they're, they're doing, what's changed in their behaviour and see if it might be related to the pain and maybe you can think of some ways to make it easier for them, like move their mat over so they're sitting at your feet by the couch rather than having to jump up on it, mm. but they can still be close to you. That sounds good. And yeah, the vets are so helpful. So great to go and chat to the vet with your dog. Okay, so I have a question here from Tara. Thanks, Tara. Our dog has quite bad separation anxiety when we leave the house. Any ideas on how we can help him? Yeah, so separation anxiety is a big problem um, and something that we're probably seeing a little bit more of after the, the COVID restrictions where everyone's been in lockdown. Uh, so the animals have got used to people being around all the time and now they have to learn to be on their own a little bit more. So uh, when you say quite severe separation anxiety, um, I think one of the things that people need to recognise is that um, we need to monitor what's happening. Okay, so one of the important things about separation anxiety is that you're not there when the dog's showing their anxiety. So a really good thing to do is to set up some sort of a camera. So very easy to do these days. You just get uh, one of your devices like an iPad with a camera on it. You then download some baby monitoring uh, software onto your phone, really cheap. Um, you can then leave the house, go around the corner, go to the park, go to the cafe, and have a look on your phone and see in real time what your dog's actually doing. Now, if your dog is showing anxiety, like pacing, panting, howling, um, not being able to settle, salivating a lot, some dogs will uh, actually uh, urinate or defecate in the house, or they'll, they'll soil in the house. Um, some will show destructive behaviours as they try and escape. If your dog's showing some of these, again, they're really starting to get stressed and it might be time to, again, talk to your vet. 
Um, we can do some behaviour modification work, and I'll give you a few ideas there. Um, but if they're really panicking, I think we need to try and reduce that anxiety, that that suffering. So if your dog's in pain, you give them some painkillers. It's not solving the problem, but it's making their quality of life better. So for some dogs with separation anxiety, when they're really, really stressed, it might be worth giving them some anti-anxiety medication just to um, help with their quality of life and their welfare whilst we work on doing some behaviour modification work. And what we do there primarily is that we start leaving them for gradually longer periods of time, but only if they remain calm and relaxed. So that's where that video monitoring comes in again, because when you leave the house, you need to be keeping an eye on them and making sure that they're okay and come back before they get stressed. So that might mean to start with that you just leave out the front door, shut the door, come straight back in. Okay, and you might just start there and keep doing that until the dog's like, yeah, you're left again, that's fine. Um, and then you'll leave for five seconds before you come back in, 10 seconds. Maybe you walk to the letterbox and back. Then you walk to the letterbox and down the street and come back. And you sort of mix it up a bit. Sometimes you go for a longer time, a shorter time, and you gradually build up. And all the time you're going to be monitoring what the dog's doing. And if you walk to the end of the street and they start <laughs> starting to pace and get stressed, you've gone too far you have to go back a step. And again, like we were talking about with the uh, thunderstorms, sometimes if you can get some really good um, anti-anxiety medication on board for these really stressed uh, dogs, then um, they will learn that when you're away, they're not feeling stressed, okay? So they experience your absence without getting stressed. And over time, you can then wean off the medication because they've learned that actually mum's not home but I don't feel stressed and again you need to talk to your vet um, and if it's really really severe um, which some cases are your vet might even refer uh, you to someone like myself to a, a specialist in in behavior who's going to be help you out with a, a really detailed plan uh, to help your your animal out Thank you so much, Dr. Gabby, for answering that one. Now, I'm just checking. I can see one more question and then we will um, cross back to Jimmy who can bring the session to a close. The last question is, I have two dogs and, and their names. I've got the names here, Yandy and Samba. They get, a, they get along amazingly, but I've seen dogs not get along. I want to know... Does it depend on gender, species? What's What are those factors? Yeah, what sort of factors make a difference as to whether dogs get along um, well or not? Interestingly, some of the research shows that it's siblings, so um, dogs from the same litter that don't get on so well. Uh, some of the research also suggests that um, it's more common to see two female dogs together not getting on. So sometimes it's better to have a male and a female. Now, just remember, these are sort of generalisations. You know, it doesn't mean that every two female dogs aren't going to get on, but there's more of a chance that we're going to see two females not getting on or two dogs from the same litter um, as they get older. Um, I don't think it makes much difference as far as breed goes. Uh, I don't think we see any differences there. There are a number of different reasons why dogs won't get on. So probably number one is I just don't like other dogs, <laughs> okay? Um, and some dogs just aren't very social or they just prefer their own space in their own time. So imagine it's like this. There's somebody at school who's just like in your face the whole time. Hey, I want to play. I want to do things. Let's do this. Let's do that. Let's party. Come on, let's go. And actually, you're someone who just likes to sit and hello, have a bit of a chat to someone occasionally. But you're not this full on party animal who wants to go all the time. Gee, are you guys going to be best friends? Maybe not. You might be able to tolerate each other and learn to be together at school. But are you going to be best friends? Probably not. So there are personalities that come into it. Um, sometimes there's things like uh, what we call resource guarding. So that might be, hmm, I don't like you being around because that's food and I want all the food. Okay, so they're guarding the food. And in some cases, we'll see dogs guarding their owners. So we see aggression between dogs in the same household, but it's only when the owner's present. If the owner walks away, the dogs get on fine. When the owner's there giving attention to one dog, 
that's when we see problems because it's a little bit of jealousy uh, coming in there. So for me, I do see dogs uh, in the same household that are fighting. And my first job is to work out what's motivating that fighting. Only then can I work out how to treat that problem. Thank you for explaining that, Dr. Gabby. It is fascinating. I'm sure we could chat to you for another hour to get all those questions answered. But we are going to hand back over to Jimmy now to close our session. Thank you for everyone who has been patient with our technology yeah. issues today, including the um, stabiliser packing it in. So <laughs> much appreciated. Thank you, Jimmy. Over to you. Yeah. And thank you so much, uh, Gabriel, Dr. Gabriel and Emily. I hope you guys have a good rest of your day. And uh, thank you to everyone else who also joined us for this for this meeting as well. Uh, and yeah, thanks for the great questions as well. Hopefully we'll see you all again soon. And we hope you all enjoy your school holidays and are excited to get back to Scouts. Now is the time to start thinking about what adventures you want to have this year and meeting as a unit council to plan. Now is the time to be a Scout. Adventure is calling. When our city stood still and grew quiet, we suspended our dreams for the reality of lockdown. We dreamt of a day when we could meet our friends again, explore the outdoors. But through it all, Scouts stayed connected, making big plans to return to the outdoors and make the most of the opportunities of the world around us. So come join us as we unleash experiences of a lifetime. Can't you hear Adventure Calling? Now's the time to be a Scout.